There was a time in my life when I would sometimes come home and I would find the cabinet doors open. I would find sometimes doors to rooms open, but no one had been home. And I wondered, why were they open like this? Now, another time, I remember sitting in my home and seeing cabinet doors open without anyone being there and seeing doors open and close without anyone opening them or closing them. Now, as I'm describing it, that sounds like a ghost story. There's another detail that helps you to understand what was going on. But I remember that one of the first times I actually visibly saw the doors swing open like that, I happened to go outside my apartment building. I was living in Kazakhstan, Almaty, Kazakhstan. And I went outside and I found almost all of the people from our building were standing out in the courtyard, with the exception of my family, because we didn't know better. And they began to use this word that I didn't know, Zimletresenya. And as I asked, what is Zimletresenya? They asked me, how many times did the building shake? And I realized they're talking about an earthquake that we had just gone through. And I said, twice. And they said, Peter, which is what they called me. Peter said it was twice also. Let's all go back inside now. So you see, I learned something that day about how the tremors take place when there's an earthquake. There's the initial tremor and then there's an aftershock that takes place. Sometimes aftershocks can happen over and over and over depending on the situation. Now, we lived in an earthquake prone zone in Kazakhstan. We also lived in Turkey, which had earthquakes. Although while we were there, I don't really recall any tremors. That doesn't mean that there weren't any. Uh, I just got used to them probably while I was asleep. You know, you would have those moments when you'd wake up sometimes in an earthquake zone and you wondered, why did I wake up? And now that I'm 56, I have those moments as well, by the way. But um, I, I have a map here that shows the seismic activity in Turkey between the year 1900 and the year 2017. And you can see that all around the area where the seven churches were, uh, there were lots of earthquakes and throughout other parts of Turkey as well. In the year 17 AD, <clears throat> there was a terrible earthquake in the area of the seven churches, and several of the cities were destroyed. The Roman government had offered to pay to restore each of those cities that were affected. Uh, some of them received the payment, while others said no. Uh, and it kind of reminds me a little bit of, of the government stimulus packages that we've been experiencing now during COVID-19. Philadelphia suffered greatly due to the earthquake. But you see, Part of the damage that was going on in Philadelphia was that for a considerable period of time, they were having aftershocks. Not just one, not just two, but dozens and dozens. And they would happen at, at times when nobody was expecting it. And it was a very scary time for the people in Philadelphia because masonry might fall down and kill you. And so people began to erect tents outside the city. They would go into the city to do things that they needed to do, but they would carry on most of their business outside because they were afraid of the aftershocks. Another thing that would happen with the aftershocks is that the doors would swing wide open. Or in some cases, the doors would be stuck fast because of the shifting of the buildings. And these doors could not be opened unless you were trained and talented to be able to lift the structure and get that door open. In the year 1911, my former city of Almaty had had such a terrible earthquake that most of the buildings in the town, in the city, were destroyed. And there were lots of yurts, which are these felt, round felt tents, that were also destroyed. But when the yurt was destroyed, that didn't really hurt many people. One of the things, though, that was really difficult in that earthquake was that up in the mountains, there were mudslides caused by the earthquake. And these mudslides came down into the city and they killed many people. So I believe it was over 400 people that were killed. After that, they erected three barricades, at least three barricades, there may have been more, but at least three that I can recall that were erected up in the mountains to prevent mudslides from coming down into the city again. I remember that we used to live below one of those and move to another area where we were below another one. And that second one that we were below, I used to walk to it. It was one of my... Uh, weekly activities to take a walk up to the dam and pray and then usually try to catch a ride with somebody back. Sometimes I would drive up there just to pray. Uh, when I have teams coming to visit, I would take them on prayer walks because it was not just an opportunity to go into the mountains from our home. 
it was an opportunity for us to pray through the villages that we were walking through. And many of these villages had people from the Caucasus regions. In fact, um, many of the people that we would pass by were actually Chechen people. And you may have heard about the Chechens in the news because most of the Chechens, if not all, had been moved to Kazakhstan during World War II. And later they began to slowly move back to Chechnya and there's been unrest there. But I would go up there and, and just have a chance to pray and meditate up there in that quiet place. Now, as I tell this story, I'm remembering another story, and all these are related. You see, our church that we had started there called Joyful News, one year they wanted to have a camp, and they wanted to have a camp further, um, further east from where I lived, where that uh, barricade was. And I figured it was a safe place. It was another valley with a river running through it. Um, but I wasn't involved with the camp. They all said that they wanted to do the camp themselves. And this went on for about three or four weeks. It was a rustic camp, only tents, no trailers or anything. Uh, they cooked everything they needed. They actually had a, an old grandmother, what we call a babushka, who was there to cook. And she loved sleeping outdoors. And uh, many of the people enjoyed sleeping outdoors. They would, they would love to go and work in their special garden plots that were outside the city and they enjoyed sleeping outdoors at those times. And so our church had this rustic camp. And Clover and the kids and I would go out there and uh, I would teach some, um, you know, once or twice a week and go on back into the city. And all of, almost all of our children and teenagers and many of our young adults were involved in the camp. It was really, really exciting for them to have that camp. After the camp was over, I had some people visiting and I was showing them around the area. And I said, well, let me show you this camp. Uh, this area where our church had a camp. And when we got there, it was completely changed because a mudslide had come through and it looked like concrete. It was mud and stones all over the place where the camp had been. And I would think, what a horrible, horrible situation if our church had been there at the time of the mudslide. That would have been the end for those children and those teenagers. We call storms, hurricanes, earthquakes, mudslides. We call them acts of God. That's what the insurance company calls them. Today in the sixth letter to the seven churches, we're reading one of two letters that does not contain a rebuke, but instead is encouraging the people. I'm encouraged that two out of the seven churches did not need to be rebuked. The city was called Philadelphia. And you know what that means, brotherly love. It was founded by a man who loved his brother so much and he did it in honor of his brother. It was relatively young, less than 300 years old at this point, And it had been founded in order to, to disseminate and propagate Greek culture and language for the region. Because in that region, there were people that were very hostile to the Greek culture and Within a short period of time, within a, a generation or two, the people had forgotten their own native languages and they learned Greek and the Greek became their native language. So I'm going to read the first part of this letter and then I'll read the rest of it at the end. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. The title of my message is An Act of God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that we live in a time in which you are still active and you are still working. And yes, Lord, I know that things like COVID-19 and other things that are out of our control are often called acts of God. But Lord, what I'm really looking for today is the act of God that you're leading us to. Lord, that you're making available for us in order to bring honor and glory to your name. Lord, we love you 
and we honor you this day in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. The writer. I want to talk a little bit about the writer, or um, I didn't want to call him the dictator because um, that doesn't sound very good. But Jesus is the one who dictates the letters, and he describes himself in the various letters in this way. Um, he says that he holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. We remember that the seven stars are the seven pastors or the bishops of the churches, and the lampstands are the churches. And so Jesus holds the leadership of the church in his hand, and he walks among the churches. The second time he addresses a church, he says that he is the first and the last, the one who died and came to life again. The third church he writes to, he says, I have the sharp, double-edged sword. And we understand that to be the word that comes out of his mouth. To the fourth church, he says, his eyes are like blazing fire and his feet are like burnished bronze. And the next church, he says, that he was full of the Holy Spirit and reminds us that he holds those seven stars again, the church leaders. Next week, he's going to describe himself as the Amen, the faithful one the true witness, and the ruler of all God's creation. So how does he describe himself today? He describes himself as holy and true, as well as he says that he holds the key of David. We understand the holy means to be set apart. Now, Jesus is holy, but in a sense, we shouldn't think of him as being set apart from others. What we have to recognize is he has set everything else apart from himself. Everything that is unholy has been set apart from him. He is true. As he said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is holy, and Jesus is true. He is also the key of David. What is the key of David? Well, there was an arrogant servant in the time of Isaiah, and he was a servant to the king uh, of Judah at that time. And God decided to replace that arrogant servant with someone named Eliakim. And the arrogant servant's name was Shebna. And so God made a declaration of placing Eliakim over Shebna. And he talks about this in Isaiah chapter 22, beginning at verse 20, where he says, in that day, I will summon my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and fasten your sash around him and hand your authority over to him. He will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem and to the people of Judah. I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. So we see this connection between the key of David that Jesus talks about and the key of David that God talks about giving to Eliakim back in the time of Isaiah. This key was the ability to go anywhere in God's house. And as well, because of the holy nature of this key and the faithfulness that it represents, I'm sure that Eliakim could go anywhere because people would open up the doors for him because he had the key of David. Christ has this key. In fact, Christ is the key. He opens doors for us. Haven't we seen doors open in our lives and we knew that Christ had opened those doors? The city of Philadelphia had been a center for the dissemination of Greek ideas, culture, and language. And now it would be a city to disseminate and propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, this church, excuse me, this city and this, the church in the city remained a center for Christianity even into the early 20th century as it was an important city for the Greek Orthodox Church. And the only reason why it moved is that uh, in the early 20th century, all of the people that were Greek ethnically, even though they might not have spoken Greek, they spoke Turkish, but they were taken out of that part of Turkey and moved to Greece where they couldn't communicate with people. And in their place, Turks that were living, ethnic Turks that were living in, in Greece were moved from Greece over to Turkey. Here they were speaking Greek, but they were Turks themselves. Kind of confusing situation in history. Just as God took the key of David from an unfaithful and an arrogant servant and gave it to one who was faithful. So Jesus uses this key of David to open doors for us, open doors for his faithful to walk through. 
I take from this that you and I need to be faithful to Christ, faithful in Christ, faithful with Christ, faithful Christians. Faithful in Christ or faithful to Him is something that happens in all of our daily life experiences. I think the sad thing is that sometimes we might think that we're being faithful to Christ because of the TV shows we watch. And that's part of being faithful, but that's not enough. Uh, cleaning up our language. Um, I, I get tired of hearing, hearing people use bad language, and especially Christians, but, but other people use it as well. Now, that's a, that's a faithful thing, but we've got to be careful about other things, too, that we do that really betray our selves as being unfaithful. Sometimes I believe that here in America, we even get to this point where we shop at certain stores or we eat at certain restaurants because of our faithfulness to Christ. There have been people who wouldn't go to Target because they didn't agree with Target's position or they want to go only to Chick-fil-A because they want to support uh, what was considered Christian. They'll only vote certain ways. And, and I, I've heard Democrats say that they'll only vote uh, Democrat. I've heard Republicans say they'll only vote Republican and they will base this on their Christian belief and their Christian faithfulness. But the thing is, it doesn't matter how you vote because if you vote a certain way, but you are disrespectful, argumentative, judgmental, rude, and callous and hateful towards people, then that one moment in the voting booth does not make you faithful. It's the everyday moment of loving your brothers and your sisters, your family, your enemies, and the people around you. Christ is looking for faithful ones who will walk through the doors that he opens. How many open doors are there today? Well, God only knows, but I believe that the answer is infinite. For each one of us, there are perhaps dozens of open doors today that we're not seeing unless we ask God to show us the open door. And we're either going to walk through the door or we're going to sit back and wait for someone else to walk through the door or sit back and miss the opportunity and the door will close. Can you imagine missing an opportunity? I mean, when you think about the stock market, Think of some unknown company that later became a household word. Wouldn't it have been great if you had walked through the open door of buying stock early on in Apple, in Facebook, in some of these other organizations that are, that are just skyrocketing in value today? If you walk through those doors, then you're rich. If you didn't, well, you missed that opportunity. How do we know, though? There are so many open doors. Which one is the right open door for us? Well, we certainly need to be praying and asking God. And this is not a teaching about the stock market, so do not use my, my illustration as a teaching for that. Do not hold me accountable for your bad decisions in the stock market or your good decisions. But the thing is, there are doors that have been opened because of COVID-19. There are doors, lots of doors that have been closed, yes, but there are many doors that have been opened. In fact, there's this door about racism that has been opened. The discussion about racism has been opened during this time, and we have many different thoughts on that. But we must recognize this as an open door, an opportunity. And who do we want people to see us act like? I want them to see us act like the children of God who know Jesus, the faithful ones. Are we numb to the opportunities, though, that are out there? I remember the story about a young man. This young man uh, was in the town that I used to pastor in a long time ago. It seems like a different lifetime ago. But while I was pastoring, this young man, uh, he was very young, actually. He was probably only about eight or nine years old, but he would run away from home. Or he would climb out onto the roof of his house. Or he would do all sorts of things. He would steal from people steal from us at times. But he was part of our church and we loved him. I remember one time standing in the window saying, come on back into the house as he was out on the roof of the porch. Finally, he came back. I remember another time when he had run away and I went looking for him and it was a cold night and I finally found him. And when I stopped the car, I put down the window and I said, come on and get in the car. But he didn't. I said, come on, get in the car. But he wouldn't. 
Of course, nowadays we probably wouldn't do things like that, but I was just trying to rescue him and bring him back to his family. He ended up getting arrested, going to court, being put into the system. I remember his mother begging the judge, please send him to some sort of Christian home or orphanage or somewhere where he can get some Christian training. She did not want him in the system. And he was sent to one of these Patrick Henry homes. And he was mentored by Christians. So several years ago, he looked me up and we got together for lunch. And he said, you know, I remember your name and I remember your family, but I don't remember a whole lot about you, Mr. Harris. But he said, one thing I do remember is when I had run away from home and you came looking for me. And when you found me, you put the window of your car down and you said, come on and get in. But I wouldn't. But I felt the heat coming from the open window and I really wanted to come in. I really wanted to be there with you. What open doors are there? What open doors are there that we need to go through? And if we don't go through them, we're going to miss out on an opportunity. You know, I like to look at the glass half full rather than half empty. But I'm, trouble see I'm having trouble seeing open doors today myself. And I have to push myself. Lord, show me the open door. Let me see the opportunities. And we're coming up with some ideas and some opportunities. You know, we always have great ideas. But we want to make sure that we follow the open doors that are created by the acts of God. In fact, instead of thinking of COVID-19 as an act of God, think about whatever open doors he provides being that act of God. I want to be able to walk through the open doors that God gives to us. This is not a time to criticize or demonize. It's a time to shine the light of Jesus to the people around us. Perhaps now we have their attention. You know, right when the quarantine started, the number of views of church videos went skyrocketing. Now, it's really leveled off quite a bit and gone down some. But still, think about it. That was a great window of opportunity. There are many people who heard the Word of God at that time. And those seeds are in their hearts. When will those seeds give forth fruit? Why am I confident that God has opened doors for us? Why am I confident that He's going to do something? Because I have loved what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. It's not a mantra for me, but it is God's Word, and it speaks to me so often. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him and have been called according to His purpose. So let's keep His commands as He spoke, and let's do this because that's what He wants to do. He is rescuing us. You know, he talks about in this um, verse that he will rescue from death. Let me go on back to that. It says here, I will, verse 10, since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world and test the inhabitants of the earth. That may be referring to the rapture or it just may simply be referring to the open doors that God provides for us. And I want so much to follow through God's open doors. Now let's look at the rest of the letter. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down from heaven, out of heaven, from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. A new name. Jesus is coming soon, so hold on. Hold on to what he has given you. Hold on to it and don't let anyone take away the reward that Christ has given us and that Christ is ready to give us. But let's be true to Christ and let that be evident in our speech and in our conduct. You know, to the one who is victorious or the one who overcomes, God will make them a pillar in his temple, always with God, never to leave God ever again, never to leave his presence. And God will write a new name on us. Philadelphia had been given new names throughout history, but the name Philadelphia kept coming back, kept coming back, kept coming back. 
Today, though, it's, been, it's called Alashahir. So it has a Turkish name. But the truth is, all of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ will be given a new name one day, a special name. That new name God will write upon the faithful. It's similar to what God said in the book of Numbers. You know, it's the verses that talk about the blessing of God, and we've been enjoying this song, The Blessing, for several weeks now during the pandemic. So in Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27, the word says, The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace so that they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. In verse 27, he says, they will put my name on the Israelites. When we have God's blessing on us, we have his name on us. It is an act of God. Think about it. There are acts of God that destroy things, but this is an act of God that sustains, an act of God that blesses. You know, I thought about something that has come from these recent events that is an act of God, and it was a blessing. It's a door of opportunity. And that's these daily devotionals that we have. And I hope you're all enjoying them. I hope everybody's enjoying the daily devotionals. We have produced over 100 daily devotionals since the time of the quarantine. Now, I had wanted to do something like this, but I was too busy to get something like this done. Now that we are in this situation, we have some time freed up to be able to do what we hadn't done before. As well, I love the fact that I have my sermons finished by Friday morning so that I can record them for you. And in this way, I'm finishing my sermons usually a lot earlier in the week so that I'm able to then let it sit in my heart. And perhaps it comes out a little bit differently on Sunday mornings. These are some blessings, some open doors for me, open doors for each one of us that have happened in spite of COVID-19 or because of COVID-19, because of an act of God, God has created other acts. I'm not trying to say that our works are equal to what God does, but what I'm trying to say is that God has created opportunities. He has opened up windows. There are doors that are open now, and I'm so thankful for that. Let's learn to walk through those doors. Let's not ignore the doors that God opens for us. And sometimes we just have to ask him, Lord, show me the door, show me where I need to go through and what I need to do at this time. Let us be the light of Christ at this time. Did God send the problems that we're having? Well, that's a debatable topic. We say, well, he allowed them, even though insurance companies call them acts of God. But God promises to not let anything separate you and me from his love and from him. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. You know, I read from, Math, excuse me, from Romans chapter 8, verse 28, a few minutes ago, and I want to read now many of the other verses around that verse, because I want to read it meditatively so that we can conclude this sermon by thinking about these points that Paul makes and as they relate to the letter to the church of Philadelphia. Beginning at verse 18, Romans chapter 8, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. He does not consider present sufferings worth comparing to the glory that waits for us and that all of creation is indeed wanting to see the revelation of God's children. Continuing on, verse 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we await eagerly our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? 
But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Are we waiting patiently? Are we waiting patiently for what God has for us? I know that our spirits are groaning as we're looking forward to what God has in store for all of us. But in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. God's Spirit wants to pray through you and me. And sometimes it just comes out as groans, comes out in these other languages. Sometimes it's just us saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Do you believe that? In all things, in all things, in COVID-19, in protests, in statues being taken down. Do you know that as I preached this today, I just got news that the Hagia Sophia, which had been a church building for a thousand years and then later was a mosque, for several hundred years and has now been a museum for the last hundred years is being reverted back into a mosque again in all things that disappoints me i've been to the to that museum so many times so many times i've taken people there so many times it's hard to think of that only being a museum now but i know that in all things In all things, God works for the good of those who love him. That place, the Hagia Sophia, or as the Turks call it, the Hagia Sophia, it's beautiful. I can remember just being in there and walking around, and and my heart was wanting to worship the Lord. Even though I'm in a man-made structure, but it just caused my heart to want to worship God. Now it's going to become a mosque again. But in all things... God works together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Do we love him? Are we called according to his purpose? Things are coming down all around us here. Do we love him? Are we called according to his purpose? In all things, God works together for the good. And this is what comes next, verse 29 and 30. So important. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Do you know God wants to make you in the image of Jesus? That he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. God has called us. Those he called, he also justified. God has justified us. Those he justified, he also glorified. One day, we're going to be glorified. We will be different. Everything that we experience here on earth will just be a memory. The pains in our body, the pains in our soul, they'll be forgotten. They won't be hurting us anymore. You see, God created us. He created us through Jesus in order to walk through doors that Jesus creates and Jesus opens for us. Our salvation itself is an act of God. God putting Jesus on the cross for our behalf. God raising Jesus from the dead for our behalf. Open doors, open doors of opportunity are also acts of God. Ask God right now to show you what doors he has opened. God promises to work them out for good for those who love us and are called by him. So let's hold on to Christ Let's remain faithful and let's walk through the doors that he opens. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your goodness, for your love, and for your mercy. And I worship you, Lord. It doesn't matter where I am, I can worship you. And I thank you, Lord, that even in the silence of my heart, I can worship you. And in the loudness of my voice, I can worship you. And I thank you that you hear my worship. Lord, I look forward to seeing more doors open more doors open that we can walk through. If God is calling you to walk through an open door, let me know about it, and I want to pray with you about it. If God is calling you to walk through the open door of salvation by putting your faith in Jesus, 
for the first time. I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending Jesus to the cross. I therefore turn away from my sins and I believe in the sacrifice of Jesus in place of my sins. I thank you that you raised Jesus from the dead and I put my faith in him today and forever. Help me, Lord, to live for you and to walk with you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I was thinking of another open door, and I know here I am at the end of this message, but I just want to tell you, I remember when I was in Kazakhstan, there was a lady that worked with us, and many times she said, why don't you help at the orphanage for special needs children? And I said, I'm up busy up to here. I've got so much going on in my life. So much going on in my life. But she kept saying it over and over and over. But I was just too busy. Later on, when my son needed me and Clover in a special way, and he became involved with a group of students that began to work there at that orphanage, volunteer once a week, he said, Dad, would you come? What was I gonna say then? I was busy, but I went with him. Clover went with him. And that began a journey for us where we were with those kids almost every day for several years. There was an open door. I didn't think I could walk through it. But when God showed me I could, I didn't think I could leave that open door anymore. I had to stay there as long as I could. What open doors does God have for you? God bless you, River of Life.
place to change 